Good morning. It is Easter Sunday and we are so excited to be gathering. I'm giving you a bit of a welcome and a goodbye in some ways. We're not completely going away, but as we have learned in this past year, uh, things change and we are coming into a new time of life. We're calling it the re-church movement that is an ongoing piece. We are going to start having some live worship services. In fact, next Sunday, which is April the 11th, we will have a worship service here in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock at First Presbyterian Church. Jay Robinson will be leading that service. It will be a masked service and a distance service. So we will spread folks out and everyone will be asked to wear a mask. We are trying to do all we can to keep everyone safe in this process. Uh, unless you're watching this really early, you're probably missing. We're having an outdoor service at 9 o'clock for Easter Sunday at Covenant. And then Covenant will continue to have some distance uh, and mass safe worship services there as well. But it's exciting to be back in a place and time where we can come together. But we want you to know that if you have been nourished by this ministry, you are welcome to join us at any time. And I am certainly available to meet uh, and and talk and visit and answer questions of anything that is possible for me to do. We really just want to meet you in our community if you are nourished by this ministry that we've been able to uh, have now for over a year. Uh, what I can promise is as Presbyterians, we are not activists in evangelism. <laughs> we take seriously an understanding of the church as a place of community and spiritual growth and nurture. You are welcome here. We are affirming for all those whose path is the way of following Jesus. We understand that God's gifts are given to all. It's not limited by your gender, your orientation, ethnicity, race, or many of the other ways the world divides and diminishes us. We are not perfect, and we know that truly. Yet we are sustained by the love and forgiveness God offers and by Christian fellowship on this journey. Uh, this may be as close as we get to an evangelical statement, but we are the reformed people of God being reformed by God. So we hope that you can find a place with us. If not, we know some people just can't get out or aren't ready to do that. We'll continue to offer some live stream options for our worship that will then go up as a YouTube video as if these have been available to be viewed. And we will have a few fully recorded worship offerings throughout each month. So it is a learning curve for all of us, and we are so thankful if you have come to know us and to know something more deeply about your walk with Jesus and this life that we have together that we have been given. So, so much joy is coming to us this Easter Sunday, and I would now like to call ourselves to worship with a more traditional Easter greeting. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please join me in a prayer to begin our worship. Holy One, you come to us with power beyond all knowing. You lift all things out of the dust. You breathe love into every cell. You call us into communion with you, and you claim victory over death. Blessed be your holy name, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. I hope you've had a good uh, Easter egg hunt or a fun time with uh, dyeing eggs and, and decorating them and everything. And uh, So we're going to talk about uh, Easter today. It was springtime in bear country, and brother, sister, and honey bear were thinking about Easter. Actually, they were thinking about Easter candy. They loved Easter candy. There were so many different kinds. They were even thinking about it on their way to Sunday school one fine spring morning. My favorite Easter candy is chocolate bunnies, said brother. My favorite is marshmallow chicks, said sister. Jelly beans, cried honey bear. Their Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Ursula, overheard them. I like black jelly beans best, she smiled. But you know, there's much more to Easter than chocolate bunnies, marshmallow chicks, and jelly beans, black wise or otherwise. 
Sure, we know that, said brother. Sure, says sister. Sure, we do, said honey. One night, Jesus went to a garden to pray. While he prayed, soldiers were sent to arrest him. They took him away to prison. Jesus was brought before a wicked judge. The judge asked Jesus many questions. He wanted to show everyone that Jesus was not a king. So he ordered Jesus to be put to death by hanging on a wooden cross. The day Jesus died was a terrible day. The skies were dark and the great wind rose up and all the people were afraid. After Jesus died, his friends took him away. They put him in a tomb that was closed with a great stone. Jesus was in the tomb for two days. One morning on the third day after Jesus died, some women who knew Jesus came to weep at his tomb. They saw that the stone was rolled away and Jesus was already gone. But the angels told the women not to be afraid, that Jesus was alive once more. Jesus came to visit his friends after he rose. They were amazed and fell down and worshipped him. Jesus told them that they should spread the good news about what has happened. Finally, Jesus rose up to heaven to be with God his Father. That way we know that Jesus is alive and will live forever. Easter is about a lot more than candy, isn't it, said Sister? Yes, indeed, said Miss Ursula. There are many questions. Does this mean we shouldn't eat Easter candy? Certainly not. I wouldn't want to miss my black jelly beans, said Miss Ursula. It just means that on Easter morning, after you get your Easter baskets, you will go to church to learn more about Easter. Hooray, said the cubs, and Hosanna, added Miss Ursula. He is risen. Amen to that, said brother and sister. Let us pray. Father, thank you for sending us your son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. As we celebrate all the fun things of Easter, Help us to remember the real meaning of why we celebrate Easter. We love you so much and want to share the good news of Easter with everyone. Thank you again for loving us so much. Amen.
Join me in a prayer for illumination. Open our eyes and soften our hearts, O God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that in the hearing of your word we may receive new life. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this Easter Sunday comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our gospel reading today it comes to us from Mark's gospel. Uh, there is kind of a mystery here. If you are in your Bible following along in Mark chapter 16, you might notice that there is a shorter ending and some longer endings that come to us. Mark's gospel we understand to be probably the first gospel that was written. It has some immediacy and urgency to it. Uh, it is a little bit slimmed down in some ways from the other gospels. If you are interested in learning more about Mark's gospel, that will be one of our upcoming Bible studies here through First Presbyterian Church in Jacksonville. We do that Wednesdays at 10 o'clock. You can Zoom in with us or come and join us uh, in person if you're masked in the parlor. We'll have more information coming. But it's powerful to hear this brief story coming to us from Mark chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Throughout the Lenten season and into this Easter tide, we have been studying in some of our groups the poetry of Emily Dickinson putting those with practices and biblical verses to bring us a deeper connection to both Lent and Easter. The poetry piece that is offered for this Easter Sunday is called Tell All the Truth, But Tell It at a Slant. Tell all the truth, but tell it at a slant. Success in circuit lies, too bright for our infirm delight. The truth, superb surprise. As lightning to the children eased with explanation kind, the truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind. The words of Emily Dickinson remind us that we feel a bit of slant and disorienting when we come to this ending, this original ending of Mark's Gospel. There are no Jesus encounters. We feel the unease of this moment. So to anchor us a bit this morning, I offer a three-point sermon. That's something I usually do. But it seems in this time of abruptness, we might need something to guide us. 
First, let's not miss that very early morning walk of the women. It's a walk of the essential workers of the day, a walk that guides us still this Easter morn. These women are up with purpose while others sleep. Pilate must be sleeping, thinking the problem has been solved, death has done its duty, there will be no more. The temple leadership, perhaps feeling a bit smug, feels they have pulled off their reordering of the universe. This kingdom stuff will have to wait. They are back in control. The shouting crowds whose vocal cords may not be working fully. Now are thinking he has been crucified. We're back to normal. On this morning walk, the women go between silence and chattering. And ultimately, this walk of the morning will end in a heart-pumping run. Not unlike so many essentials that we have come to know over this past year and a few months, this pair of Mary shows up in difficult circumstances to do the work that is needed and really not sure what comes next. The talk that they share at the start of this passage is a concern. What to do about that stone, the very large stone, the stone of covering and concealing grounds each of the gospel resurrection accounts. The stone is the weight, perhaps, that we need in this glorious story to keep the heavenly realm and the earthly realm united. It is hard to grasp what happens in resurrection. None of us in this world have the fullness of an answer. The power, the story, the miraculous sense, the gifting of the spirit that is yet to come will form what we are today as the church. The gathering of those who share this good news, that death is not the last word, that love wins, and that life, the abundant life is available to all of us. It is the stone that keeps us in this realm when all of that seems too much, for we are earthly folks grounded in the reality of big stones that must be moved, problems that must be solved, all of that weight that we carry with us. And yet, for that morning, a historic morning, a spiritually significant day, if there ever was one, the stone is moved. The weight, the busyness of this world will not be the end. There is good news to share. The good news comes this morning to the two Marys from a young man in an empty tomb. There's no indication here in Mark's gospel that this is a heavenly being. Certainly dressed in white may get us thinking in that direction. But Mark also gives us another young man earlier in the arrest account of Jesus' passion story. From Mark chapter 14 at verse 51. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. It's an odd little verse. We don't have it in the other Gospels. It's hard to compare and contrast, and there has been much debate given to that. And here we have a young man, fully clothed, sharing good news in the tomb. The at times startling brevity of Mark's Gospel reminds us that our humanity is always struggling. We are those who abandon love, who abandon the way of the divine, who abandon what God has given us for good, and instead cling to the nakedness of our humanity time and time again. These past months of living have jarred most of us beyond our normalcy. Let us pray this Easter morn that resurrection brings to us a place of clothed assurance, clothed in the light Christ brings to share good news. As we hear this account from Mark, 
We can ask, who are we in the story? Where do we connect? Where does this message fill our being? Are we the young man, redeemed and ready to share good news with the world connected to Jesus? Are we the women filled with conflicting emotions and duty bound, trying to find a way in the way that seems impossible? Are we those still sleeping? The powers that be in the temple and in the culture of Rome, those who were shouting with the crowds that became a mob, are we still sleeping? Poetry has guided us this season. And I want to close this brief Easter reflection with some words from Ann Weems. Some of you will be very familiar. She is as much of a poet laureate as we have in the Presbyterian faith. She has been gone now to the heavenly realm for five years this past March. These words come to us from Advent's Alleluia to Easter's morning light. Easter comes, the shroud that covered the world is destroyed, for our God has swallowed death. We shall no longer look for him among the dead. He calls us to follow, to believe in our hearts that the people of this world will someday love one another, really love one another. If we believe that, that is not a naive hope, but God's promise. We shall not die, but we will live in him who died for us.
open now ourselves to a time of prayer. Uh, for those in this community in Calhoun County, we have been reminded again over the past two weeks the reality of the storms of life. I had the honor to, to visit some folks who had extreme damage. They know that their ancestral homes will be bulldozed, and yet they have a faith and trust in God that is affirming and brings all of us hope. But let us not forget the real struggles that are ahead for so many in our community, uh, particularly with that storm damage and along with the many other maladies of life. So with that, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need, saying, God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. With joy, we pray for all Christian assemblies united this morning at the empty tomb. Help us see you, O oh God, in those we do not expect to encounter and remove all fear from our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With gratitude, we give you thanks for our newly baptized sisters and brothers in every land. Guide them and keep them. Open their eyes again and again to your blessings. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With humility, we pray for this planet, our home. Heal what we have scarred and broken. Renew the face of the earth from north to south, from east to west, so that your creation may speak to us of your goodness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With hope and love, we pray for the nations of the world, especially those overwhelmed by war and conflict. In the light of resurrection, destroy the shroud that is cast over all who live under dictatorship in the clutches of propaganda and in ignorance. For those whose lives are continually torn by violence, even in places of freedom. Bless peacemakers who work to bring justice to their country, city, village, and household. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With compassion, wipe away the tears of all who weep. Give us the spiritual tools we need to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort those who are in any trouble. Send your angels to watch over the vulnerable and sick. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear now the prayers of our hearts in this moment of silence. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With fondness, we remember those who saw our risen Lord and witness to his resurrection so that we might have faith. May their words and deeds inspire us to sing our Alleluia again and again. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Passing from darkness to light, from bondage to freedom, from death to life, we commend to you, gracious and ever-living God, all for whom we pray. Amen.
Go now with faithful stamina into your courtyards to answer whether you know him or not. Go knowing that he who said, follow me, will stand with you. Go knowing that when you falter, he will hold you up. Go knowing that when you fail, he will forgive you. Go knowing that when you say, I know this Jesus, you will dance with the angels on Easter morn. May you know the peace of faithfulness, the joy of community, the love of grace in the name of Jesus. Amen.